All right. Okay. Perfect. What's up, Samoils? How's it going? What's up? How is the front of Masters course coming along? Is it this? It's this week, yeah. It is. Uh, yeah, it's like the twentieth. So in four days. So next Wednesday. So yeah, we're close. We are very, very close to the course. But yeah, I. Uh, it's coming along. It's definitely coming along. It's pretty much done. What the fuck is up? What's up, bro? It's pretty much done. Um, but yeah, there's a few things you got to polish up there. What's up, everyone? How we doing? Okay. This was a mistake to post. What's up, ALCB? This was a mistake to post. <laughs> I made a mistake. Uh, all right. Going go for memes. Let's go. Let's find some funny golden gopher memes and then post it on Twitter that we're going live. It's going to be my first experience in go. Looking forward to it. Oh, okay. Perfect. Like an absolute kind of beginner approach or what? Um, let's go with this one. I've used it before, but why not? Okay. Let's go live. Got to have the sirens. Um, going articles, going articles. Is it a poorly designed language? Oh, what did I just click? What the hell is this? What was that? Okay. So is it poorly designed a language? By the way, is the music too loud? Okay. And then also prepping. Also getting the uh, Go plus AWS course ready live now. Young Aflame, he in sick of mode. Boom. Boom, bop, bibbidi up. Yo, what's up, Drury Pope? What's going on? Does it matter if it is? Uh, probably not. Probably not. You're right on that. You're right on that. Yo, what's up, Chillax? Chill Ax Thor? All right, cool. This is good. Uh, Golden articles is a poorly designed language. Also getting the Go Plus. Okay, cool. Let's just let's just send it. Let's just send it. Cool. Uh, so we're on YouTube. We're on Twitch. We let Twitter know. We got to let the Discord know. All right. The harsh reality of good software. Ooh, what's this? Ooh, we could watch this. I'd be down to watch that. Oh, let's go to announcements. Gotta let the Discord know. Let's go. Uh, let's go. Uh, we're just gonna do Golang articles. Why Go is a poorly designed language plus more cool get in dope dope okay everyone everyone's known honey do fucking up oh, that toy yeah you can hear that toy in the background yep uh yeah he is definitely up mornings he is super excited uh i recently got laid off oh you got laid off oh dude that sucks Yo, what's up, Kerek Monkey? Dude, I'm sorry to hear that. I'm very sorry to hear that. Uh, time to polish that CV. Yeah, definitely start time to start polishing up that CV. Um, yeah, that he's going off with that toy. <laughs> Love with who I am. Back in high school, I used to bust it to the dance. Okay. Um... I'm trying to decide if what kind of music that I want right now. Like a light, a like a light. Let's go. Yeah, I'm I'm more in this mood. Yo, Nico, thank you so much for that T1 
on a three month streak. Come on, give me that pal. Let's go, man. I appreciate that love. Appreciate that love and support. That support or support. Um, okay, so I don't know if I want to do. Oh yeah, Delki. Of course, I can't forget about Delki. See, it always gets forgotten. Um, I'm trying to think. What do I want to do first? Ah, that's fine. We'll leave it at that. But we're gonna wake him up. Pippi and V, perfect. Okay, so I'm trying to think. We could do a few things. I had fun. I had a lot of fun going through the article yesterday. Um, I just got so many tabs open. So Delki's up. Nico with the T one, bro. At three months, that's actually crazy. Ninety days. Ninety days, bro. Crazy. Gotta stay hydrated. All right. Like I am. I mean, we could just peruse. Like, how is the job market for Golang developers? That's a good one that I can like give my opinion on. There's just overall Reddit go. Uh, stick with it. Yeah, I mean, there's so much stuff, and there's also the harsh reality of good software. Like this could be something awesome. You know. The harsh reality of good software. I'm down to kind of rock with that. The harsh reality of good software. Oh, and, and you know what I found recently? Make it 90 months. Chill, chill, chill. You know what I also found? Uh, look at this. Inter Internet made coder. Look at this. This guy's back. Uh, how to master web development and actually get a job in 2024 market. Dude, I swear, this guy makes the same video over and over again. He doesn't learn. He's not learning. Three hacks to learn coding fast. And he just talks about the same thing over and over again. And I watched a bit of it. I watched like a little portion of this video and it's like, dude, he, I think he talks about himself in this somehow. I don't even know. By buying his course, it does include a promo. He, he includes a promo now. So in, in, in the video, you actually see it's like includes a paid promotion. So I think he's being more transparent, but promoting himself much. I know. We can watch this too. Yeah, I don't know. We could definitely watch it, but I think at first I don't want to. I don't want to start the day with this. You know, I don't want to start the morning with uh, <laughs> with an internet made coder video. I would much rather do something else uh, first. Um, yo, what's up, the brief frost? I'm doing well. How are you doing? Just literally waking up. Gonna start a quick stream. A little quick stream. Nothing too. Nothing too crazy. You know, nothing too crazy. Um, yeah, how are you doing? Morning or something. Yo, what's up, Strictly Type? When I see your name, I think of Simply Unlucky for some reason. Okay, we don't need the YouTube. But why Go is a poorly designed language? What do you guys want? I, I actually can't decide. I have too many articles. I have way too many articles cooking right now. This should be fun. Yeah, it's going to be fun. It's always going to be a fun stream. But I need to figure out what we're going to do first. So, March 16th. March 16th, 2024. 2024 or 5. Okay. Uh, so, four days away. Four days away from my front-end master's course. Right? So, go plus AWS. Okay, well, that doesn't work in JS. <laughs> the guy we talked about Go, yeah, this one. It's a pretty short, concise article. Uh, article, what? Article. Uh, non obvious. So, it's a good one. It's a good one. I think we might start with this. What do you think? Should we start with this 
or should we start with something else? I mean, there's so much. It's like current software engineers have no deep knowledge. There's the harsh reality. I guess it can be between this. The not not this one, sorry. It's going to be between the harsh reality of good software or the Go article. Which one, chat? What do you guys want to do first? Yo, what's up, Epic? Thank you for that prime, man. Appreciate that. On that streak, let's go. <laughs> Show us Honey Bull. Honey Bull is uh, busy right now. He was going, he was destroying one of his toys. Okay, you know what? I'm going to be, be right back. I got to change my t-shirt. So when I come back, we're going to do this Go article, okay? I'll be right back. Two seconds. We back, we back. I just had to put on a hoodie. All right. So go this one first. You want to do this one first? All right, I'm down. I'm down. I'm not against it. Can you guys see this? Let's change the title then. Uh, why? Go is a poorly designed language. All right, can you guys read this? I should have, I was waiting for this. Hold up. I was actually waiting uh, to do this article for a minute. For a very long time, because I saw in this r slash programming, why it goes a poorly designed language from a perspective of a Go lover. So I, I saw this, I'm like, this is this has to be a good good article, right? Like, it has to be good. Why Go is a poorly... Whoops. Dude, you're alive. Nice. Yeah, I am alive. Go is an X. Why Go is a poorly uh, designed uh, language uh, from the perspective of a go lover so i can already okay as someone who writes go i think i'll be able to say a few things yo what's up mr stash bro yeah the stash is gone what's up welcome from argentina i'm curious to see how much that changed yeah i'm i'm pro i'm well, okay i'm gonna assume that go hasn't changed too much but i would love to see oh you can listen to this that's a cool feature Dude, I got too many notifications. Yo, what's up, Rudy? Will the AWS part of the course be beginner friendly? Yeah, it's all beginner friendly, Rudy. It's all beginner friendly. The whole goal is to make it is to make everything beginner friendly in the AWS in the in the entire course, right? Um, so it is all beginner friendly. Okay, uh, from go to AWS. And at the end, at the end, you will know how to deploy uh, software. Software uh, at scale, right? And the scale portion is just, we are going to use AWS Lambda. Even though like architecturally, uh, in AWS Lambda, it has its pros and cons too, right? Uh, but to each their own. To each zone for sure. The Go mask is the cutest thing. How much does it cost? If you have a free, um, if you have a free, what do you call it? Uh, student account on GitHub, the front end master course is free. And yo, Kid Quet, what's up, man? Subscribe for 44 months, bro. That's oh, four years. Four years, dude. 
Absolutely insane. That founder badge, give me that, pal. How do I do a chargeback? No, you can't. You can't. You're signed up for life. Yes, board. Uh, board Deepak. We actually go through all of Go from a beginner perspective too, right? Uh, so you, even if you've never used any Go before, you could use this course. Why not something like ECS, EC2 containers or Fargate? That's way too not beginner friendly, right? Like I don't want people to have to pull in their own like image from the ECS repository or deploy, deploy their own Docker containers, right? It's just Lambda is the easiest, quite literally. Which cloud GPU is the best to use? I mean, it depends on what you need, right? It depends on what you need. I went deep on Twitter yesterday evening. That's horrendous. I don't want to know this. Um, I kind of want to redo this. Hold on. So I'm going to quote tweet this. Never do that. Never do what? The ECS one? AJ is one of the best dudes to talk about for Lambda stuff. Uh, AJ, you can actually watch the, the course at all. The front end masters go in AWS. Never go deep on Twitter. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, any other prerequisites? I mean, yeah, there's going to be obviously like a prerequisite. Like you have to have an AWS account. Everything's going to be on free tier. Um, I haven't plugged a course. I still haven't done it. It's live, bro. It's front end masters. It's, uh, it's literally happening on the 20th Wednesday. So like I haven't done it yet. I've just been prepping for it. Uh, so we're going to do it live and we're going to see how it goes. I'm definitely kind of congrats myself for it. Yeah. Thanks. We'll see. We'll see. I'm definitely going to be feeling it. Can't wait to watch it. Awesome. Yeah. I mean, we'll find out what happens. We'll find out what happens. Right. Uh, but just asking EC2 Docker droplets and server provided by Linode Voltrix are all the same. Um, are they all the same? Would the course be available on a different platform? So I will be streaming the course here on Twitch. So the course will be streamed uh, on Twitch, on this channel, on Wednesday. And for the VOD and like other materials in the slides, that's only going to be available uh, with the front end master subscription. All right. What's up, Suman? But why did you choose AWS? I chose AWS for a bunch of different reasons. The main one is here. So the main reason, but there's the music too loud, right? AWS is so polarizing and I actually fail to see why. Uh, I use, so why I choose, why I chose AWS. One, the obvious one, I have the most experience with it, most experience with AWS, all right? Uh, I really like CDK, okay? For teaching uh, infra as code. Uh, better than Terraform, don't kill me. Uh, and also one, like AWS has the biggest market share for cloud, right? Uh, everyone sub to Melky on YouTube. I think everyone here is already sub to my YouTube, bro. Like if you look like, <laughs> Terraform is so garbage. Have you tried SST? I have tried SST. I definitely have tried SST, yeah. No love for Terraform. Yeah, no love for Terraform for me. It's not that I don't love Terraform. Uh, it's just, I think CDK is more, CDK makes more sense. Yeah, bro. I think the subscriber count, like we're like buzzing. We're big time buzzing on, on, on the social YouTube. How far are you from 25,000? We, uh, okay. We're less than 4,000 away. We'll get there eventually. Maybe, maybe. Yeah. So this is why I chose AWS. Um, Obviously, like, I'm not going to pick GCP because it's all, it also, like, AWS also has the most services available, okay? Um, and, yeah, like, AWS gets a lot of flack. People, like, don't like AWS. And I'm like, why not? Right? Like, why don't you like AWS? And every time, the main reason you make your intern sub to you, hell yeah. The main reason people tell me why they don't like AWS is down to two reasons. One, they're scared of some costs running away with it. So like a bill that like you have some sort of instance running and that you're unaware of it. And then one day you wake up with like a frightening bill. All right. Uh, so that's, that's one thing. And two, it's like the, I always hear like the AWS docs are too crazy. So.
Bro, I'm not gonna lie to men, but only 60% of your viewers on your last video sub. So this Thursday, yeah. This guy's like a statistician, dude. Yo, Param, thank you for that follow. Complexity is the reason why I don't like AWS. Complexity, interesting. AWS is two to three times bigger than any other cloud. It'll be a bigger audience. It's also the most mature and has the most services. Yep. Yeah, I mean, Azure is growing fast, but I still don't think it's going to compete with AWS, to be honest. It is growing. Like, the market share is definitely growing in favor for, for a Azure, but I don't think AWS is going to be dethroned. Ugly ass UI, you know what's crazy? With CDK, you don't have to worry about any UI. That shit isn't even like a, a issue. Right? With you, with like, you don't have to worry about it. You just see a lot. That's what I use. Yeah. That's what we use CDK. Infrastructure is code. I barely touched the UI. I think we're beginning a daunting UI and shit ton of service, especially for beginners, is what makes it not so appealing. Yep. I mean, I agree. AWS can be super intimidating and like the docs are pretty, the docs are pretty juicy, right? Like the docs are pretty thick. You don't have all the options in CDK. There's something, there's sometimes is things that are just click options first. I don't think that's true. I think CDK offers you everything. I don't think the settings are only, that are not available in CDK, that are available only through the UI, through like click deployments. Do you have an example of that? As far as I know, CDK captures everything. It's a banger. Although I basically only use AWS since work. Yeah, I mean, that's how I got introduced to AWS, which I'm grateful for. Yeah, Cognito had some options that were only in UI and not available in CDK. Interesting. Interesting. Yeah, I think it's really good coverage. Maybe five years ago, it was common for service to launch without CloudFormation support, but now it's mandated that all new feature services have day one support. You can always use CloudFormation if you need to, yeah. One thing I really hate for all the big cloud providers is that there is no kill switch functionality that stops you from going overboard and fucking my bank balance. Um, Like, there's no direct kill switch that's like, I hit this and everything, like, stops. Well, you can provision billing modes. You can provision different ways of like instant sizes. Like, don't use serverless. This, yeah, I mean, a lot of people, the serverless thing, you know what's crazy? The serverless thing, people are always scared of the AWS gonna run a build. Bro, the horror stores are coming through like Vercel and shit. Like all these serverless like wrappers are literally causing people to have like bills are up to like 5K, right? And like the reason why they're having these large bills is because their service picked up steam and like a lot of people are in like invoking it, uh, which is good. But like if you get a fat spike that you didn't provision your AWS Lambda properly. Yeah. I mean, especially with Vercel, Vercel is relentless, man. If you get viewer, if you get user on Vercel and uh, you get a bill, you're done. You're done. A $5 virtual machine isn't ever going to cost you more than five bucks. Yep. I mean, it's going to be hard to get your uh, Nelfi with its recent 100K story. Yeah, I mean, all these providers, all these wrappers that pro offer, like, serverless deployments, like, I don't know. It's still, I've never been a fan of Vercel. I've said this, like, pretty much uh, since I was able to make my own opinion on it. I'm not a fan of Vercel. Right? I'm not a fan of Vercel whatsoever. That's just... Uh, that's just my opinion, if, if I'm being honest. I love Vercel. I don't love it, but there are some cool features. Yeah, I have Hetzner. So I have Hetzner. The best combo is Hetzner and Coolify. Like, don't at me on that. I'm sure I can your infrastructure can be your de detriment when trying to debug things when it goes wrong. Mm. Digital Ocean Linode. Nah, I mean, personally, like, so first of all, I want to say, like, 
if I am not doing a serverless architecture, which like there's only very few cases where I actually want to do a serverless architecture, um, I would use uh, Hetzner plus Coolify, and that's it, and that's it, right? Like that's like there's no question. Like, I don't need to explore anything else. I don't need to do anything else. Coolify literally gives me everything I need. Every single person I've introduced to Coolify has been like, this is fucking game changing. Every person that I'm like, yo, check a Coolify first. They're like, okay. And they see all the options and they're like, damn, this is actually fucking insane. Because it is. Coolify is insanely beautiful. Hetzner is great. Hetzner is great. It's the best like price. I think it's like actually some services that offer uh, a better rate. But Hetzner is pretty well established. You first time hearing about Coolify, let me show you. Let me pill you, bro. Look at this. This is this is Coolify, homie. So this is Coolify. It's um. I gotta make a video on this. Uh, but Coolify is an open source, uh, self hostable Heroku and Nellify Vercel alternative, right? And uh, what you do is you basically get a Hetzner server, like a fucking box, a Linux box, a droplet, whatever the fuck, and you just run this command that basically spins up this entire service in your server, and then essentially you get this. You get this dashboard. And in this dashboard, you can basically deploy your app. So I have two apps here, Resu AI and AstroStation.me. They actually have ser they actually have users, not a big deal. They actually have users, not a big deal, not a big deal. Uh, and then what you get out of it is like a bunch of stuff out of box. So you can see the status of your apps. They each got their own routing, their own DNS ports and own like VP, uh, VP, VPS systems. You can spin up in a database that hooks up into these uh, applications, either publicly or privately. And you can actually get uh, like, like I just showed you here, uh, plausible, so you can analytics. And lastly, you can even spin up CICD. So if you click astrostation.me, you can actually go into where the Git repository lives and it's going to run a new build on every successful push. Yeah, Resu AI is actually down right now. I actually got to put Resu AI down for the second uh, because the change in the chat GPT um, API, I have to fix it, so... Yep, yep, yep. Got a got some things I gotta fix, you know. <clears throat> I'm learning. Yo, is the music too loud? Gonna check out LFF, uh, Coolify for your next app. Yeah, you definitely should. It's made by one guy, Andras. Uh, he's in Romania. The music is good. Yeah. All right, so you're learning Go. What's the playlist? It's just some random YouTube playlist, homie. Uh, I'm learning Go. I already did React Express. What are your suggestions? Like back in a microservice or something like this. I mean, yo, what's up, Nick Warders? What's up, homie? Good to see you, man. Six month streak. I'm happy they enjoyed six months of milky content. And I can tell you one thing is I appreciate that support, man. Give me that pow. Um, I would say if you're starting with Go, man, just spit up an HTTP server. Right, if you come from Node and Express, see how Go spins up an HTTP server versus Express. <laughs> Waldito, what's up, bro? How's it going? Devon AI can do everything. When you grow the egress and storage costs are where all the money is. See this. Data egress. Okay, so Cloudflare, Cloudflare is still like undefeated. So Hetzner, AWS, holy, wow. Wow, yeah, like look at this, bro. I mean, I'm, I'm defending AWS here, right? But like, like you can see here, like Nellify Vercel Render, pretty, pretty expensive stuff. You have... AWS, Alibaba Cloud, and, uh, and Azure, okay. Fly.io, okay. Oracle Cloud. Yeah, I mean, for data egress, right? Like, because it says here, this is the cost of sending data out of the cloud provider's network to the public internet. 
Like, I wonder what app are you building where you're going to be sending 100 gigabytes of, well, 100 gigabytes in a month. I won't be too surprised depending on what the app is. But like for most apps, most like apps that people here are going to build aren't going to be sending, aren't even going to be touching this whatsoever. <laughs> All right. So I do agree. It's one of those things that is definitely uh, overlooked. Uh, but if you're building something pretty heavy, like gnarliness, yeah, you can uh, you can definitely see some pretty gross stuff. You can see here, my network IO is this for Astro Station. I'm hitting 1.44 gigabytes out of I an allocated one terabyte. All right. Uh, I'm curious if people are building APIs or big chunks of functionality in cloud formation workers and cloud flare workers. Maybe I know a lot of people are picking up uh, Cloudflare now. I, I wish I knew more Cloudflare. Like I have barely used them. I have them on one, but Versailles on CF workers. Mm. Uh, yo, what's up, Param? Uh, <laughs> Melky out here looking like Stephen Thompson UFC boy. I look like Stephen Thompson right now. Uh, what language have you worked before going? The only language I know are like TypeScript, Python, and Golang. Man, YouTube has to do something about music for streams. It's so plain here. I know. But I can't play music on YouTube because I'll get taken down, dude. I'm sorry. I'll get taken down. I've tried. For the YouTube homies, I've tried. I've tried, okay? Um, and it's just like, I'm going to get... You're going to watch UFC 300? I am going to watch UFC 300, yeah. What coffee beans do you use now? Um... Right now, I'm using this local brewery called Lardo. Go is bad, learn Go based. Yeah. <laughs> Yo, you gotta hit him with the fucking reverse psychology, right? Have you tried RQL Lite? No. What? Before I ask you what it is, what problem does it solve? Before I learned anything, I don't want to learn anything new, man. I want to master stuff I know. So before I learn anything new, I want to ask like, what problem does it solve? Yeah, it's four liters. That's four liters of water. It's uh, it's furious. It's thick. Um, going to read why go is a. Poorly designed language. Yo, what's up, Bite Lordy? What's going on? Next upgrade to five liters? Nah. Why am I getting so many notifications? <laughs> Not gonna lie, I thought you got a haircut or something. <laughs> Bro, I can't even. Nah. I know, I got way too many tabs. I got way too many tabs. I, I don't have this many tabs typically, man. Real talk, I'm abandoning my Moonlander. The Kinesis Adventure comes on Tuesday. No, you shut the fuck. Why, bro? Dude, I thought we were friends. Dude, what do you mean? We are, I'm sorry. Dude, ugh. I'm old, my wrists are old. Bro, why? Why are you such a prime simp? Prime doesn't need more simps. God, enough. I need that con. No, you don't. No, it's all a marketing scam. You don't need con. What is concavity, bro? What does it mean, dude? What does it mean, bro? You're gonna have a fucking Sega Genesis on your desk now. Give me Kinesis, please. Oi. Don't worry, we got bionic arms by 2035. I need, bro. <laughs> what are you gonna do with your Moonlander? AJ, what are you gonna do with your Moonlander? Okay, on a real talk. Don't you say anything to Daddy Prime. I know, I know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What are you, what are you gonna do with your Moonlander? Melky, you're probably looking smaller today. Thank you, Ember. Appreciate that. Yeah. No, this is actually all AI. I'm actually re I'm rendering the image while going through an AI pipeline. 
But if I like the adventures, I'll sell the moon letter or give it away or something. Okay. If you're going to do a giveaway, let me know. Uh, I'll hype it up. I'll be like, we need someone, t- we need a true user. We need a true person to use this Moonlander. AJ's, uh, AJ's little flimsy wrist can't handle it. <laughs> no, I'm kidding. I already have two Moonlanders. I already have two Moonlanders. I-, I don't need a third one. Or do I? Or do I? Maybe. Maybe. I don't know. Uh, yo, what's up, VWeb Code? Hello from the other side. What's up, Nicholas? What's up? What's up? Uh, does Milky mean Milkies? No, it means scrawny. Don't you guys love when my camera does this? What's up, Foo Force? Welcome in, bro. Foo Force, can you send me that tweet again? Dude, Foo Force, I literally... Oh, it's you, Nico? Nice. Foo Force. I had your tweet. You tweeted at me saying you found a better article to get like updated ghost stuff. And I was going to read it. But bro, I posted that fucking picture of my forehead and my notifications are going mod. I posted this and like I it, the thing got lost. Can you send me your the, the tweet you made for me, please? Need to add water so it looks like Radiohead. I got you, bro. Uh, Air Asia has just landed. <laughs> Yo, do you guys want to see? This thing has the funniest memes. Look at it, look at the memes people made. Look at this. Hold on. Wait for it. We got this one. It's a medium one. We got this one. It's pretty good. Uh, me things stuff. Got this cat. <laughs> no bitches. None here. We got this. Offensive ones. This was marked offensive. This was marked offense offensive. You guys, you guys kill me. I'm the last code bender. Yeah. I am the last code bender. All right, let's, uh, we have, uh, it's probably gonna be a long stream, so why rush it? Why rush the stream? You know, it's probably gonna be a long one. Cool hoodie. Yo, thank you, man. Appreciate that. Bro, where's hair? The hair is here, bro. Mehdi. Mehdi, come on. You can't rush art. Can you? Cool if I guide when. Yo. Honestly, keep asking me to make Coolify video because I need to make a Coolify video. It's been on the back burner for so long. I need to make the Coolify video. All right. Um, I've just my, right now all my energy is going to the front end masses course. All my energy is going into that course. Once I'm done that course, I'll fill, I'll pick up the um, the YouTube videos again. Okay. I thought it was from Milky Way chocolate. No, I mean scrawny. We'll make sure we get that tutorial. Yeah. The uh, the cool fight control is coming. Okay. All right. I think we can start. We have a bunch of stuff here, so let's just remove all of this. All right. Should we? Oh yeah. Also, should we keep the music or turn the music off and I read articles? What do you guys think? Melky versus Prime arm wrestling. I'm uh, I'm gonna wait. Um. Until what language do you think is the best designed? What programming language is the best designed? I don't even know how you answer that. Off? Let me do a quick poll. Okay, music on or off for article for uh predi- not prediction, poll. Uh, music on or off for articles. Okay, uh, I'll give you guys two minutes. I'm gonna use the washroom. Age is in charge while I'm gone. Be right back.
back. That was fast. All right, off? Okay, let's do off. I've tagged you on my CF use case and chat. Can't whisper. Why does a chair has grasshopper hands? What? Uh, have I checked the Gleam yet? No. I have not. I've only briefly looked. I don't know what Gleam will do. Like, what, what purpose does Gleam serve? Okay, I'm going to turn off the music. Or at the very least, we're going to go very, very quiet. Like, now. You guys can barely hear the music, right? It's, like, barely there. Um, and you know what? I want to listen to, like, some Mac Miller. I've been in a big Mac Miller kind of vibe. Yo, what's up, Jan? Okay, let's go. So, I was stumbling upon Reddit, our programming, for a little bit. And I saw this this post eight years ago. So why go is a poorly designed language from a perspective of go lover. So first of all, eight years ago, a long time, but I'm at, when I see something for go, that's like a long time ago, I don't really get discouraged because go doesn't move fast. Go is boring. The stuff tutorials, whatever you see for go, like a while back, it's still pretty applicable, but I do want to see, um, what has changed and what did the original author mean? by their original post at that time, right? So let's see. Uh, so there's a few points here. I don't really go into them, right? Uh, an app description of Go. Go being needlessly strict about pointless pedantry while leaving gaping holes in the static semantic that could rule out real non-trivial bugs. <laughs> At the end of the day, boring is when hype is gone. Right now, Go is extremely hyped. Right now, everyone wants to write Go. Everyone loves Go. Everyone's making Go videos. So Go has a lot of hype on it right now. All right, let's just get into the article. Can you guys see this? So by Ian Bird, uh, October 28th, 2015. All right, all right. The title is quite bold. I admit it. I'll tell you more. I love bold titles. They're all about attention. Anyway, he's right. I mean... If you've ever made a YouTube video, you would, you would agree about this. Anyway, in this blog post, I'll try to prove that Go is terrible design language. Spoiler, in fact, it is. Okay. Okay. I've been playing with Go for a couple months already and run my first Hello World summer in June, I think. I'm not particularly good at math, but it's already been four months since then and got a few packages on GitHub already. Needless to say, I also had absolutely no experience of using Go in production. So take my sayings about code support, deployment, and related with a reasonable grain of salt. Mm, okay. Looks like you still use a lot of Go. Still using quite a bit of Go. What is this? Telebot? Still blue. So he's making a bot for Telegram. Interesting. In Go. So clearly he still likes Go. So spoiler. <laughs> I love Go. I love it since I tried it. It took me a few days to accept idiomatics, to overcome lack of generics, keep it up with the weird error handling and all their classical Go issues. I read Effect of Go, many articles on the Dave Chinoy Chinese blog, kept track of everything related to Go and so on. I could say that I'm an active community member. I love Go and I just can't help it. Go is amazing. Still, in my humble opinion, Go is a terribly poor design language, which does which does the exact opposite of what it advertises. Okay. Go is considered a simple programming language. Yes, it is. According to Rob Pike, they took everything out of language, making it spec just tri making it spec just trivial. This type of language is amazing. You can learn basics in hours, get into real coding straight away, and it works. In most cases, Go works just as expected. Okay. You'd be pissed off, but hopefully it works. Reality is quite different. Go is not a simple language. It's just poor. Here's some points proving it. All right. So again, we have to talk about this because this is five years, like eight years ago. Things have changed, but I don't think the language changed that drastically in eight years. Right. Um, 
I think they add up generics since eight years ago. Okay. Uh, but to say Go is not a simple language, it's a poor language. I definitely disagree. Uh, like Go is a very simple language. It's extremely simple, right? Like in terms of other comparative languages like Rust or C, um, anything like even Zig, the garbage collector does a lot of the heavy lifting for you. The type system in Go is like, at the level where you don't need anything more than the types that Go provides, right? I think TypeScript has done a poor job of handling types, to be honest. And the whole generics thing, maybe it's just me, but I was talking about this in yesterday's streams. I've been running Go like professionally for like two plus years, and I've rarely come into positions where I need to use generics. Whether that's a me issue, sure, okay. Maybe that's me. Maybe I'm just a shit developer. I don't know. I've deployed stuff on this website that you guys are using. All right. But to really say that, like this whole deal about generics, I'm just like, I mean, it's not a big, even if Go never had generics, I probably wouldn't know the difference. Um, I bet he's going to talk about the range bug with pointers. Yeah, he probably will be. I just think Go was for people having skill issue with Rust. <laughs> what do you think now? So, uh, worked at Twitch, by the way. So let's see. Reason one, uh, what you worked on on Twitch, probably like everything you, you downs, everything you handle with any kind of gifting flow, uh, fraud prevention, um, hype trains, all of that. I've, I've dealt with more real time data than, the, than all of you have to deal with. Uh, the amount of traffic and events I have to build around, uh, is insane. I'm talking about like in millions of events per second. Um, through through async and synchronous processes. So, yeah, I built a lot of shit uh, on this platform that I'm very proud of, um, and that's had like some significant impact. But people just think I'm like you know kind of just Chad. Someone said I never deploy anything in prod in one of my YouTube comments, and I'm just like, okay, how many people were working with you on that? Um, pretty much none. A lot. Every feature I've deployed has pretty much been a, a single show application. I've may may have in some in some instances there may have been another engineer help me kind of paralyze the tasks, or maybe a way team projects where there's a subject matter expert and they helped me on identifying certain portions of the code. But I would implement design everything on my own. Mostly Go, some TypeScript, some Scala. Here's the water bottle. Do I even know Go or is Devin helping you? Devin is actually, I am Devin. So reason one, slice manipulations are just wrong. Okay. Yes. Slice manipulations are pretty disgusting. Uh, in in this era, in this era, slice manipulations were, were disgusting. You got to admit. Um, I'll show you guys an example. Make dirt playground. Yeah, I hate the way. Yeah, it was bad. Um, so like with slices, right? Uh, let's just say funk main, right? Okay, so prior, and I'll say, uh, what was it? Prior to go uh, 121, I believe, uh, slice manipulation was kind of gross. Manipulation was kind of gross. So let's say you, have a, you, say you declare a slice, right? Let's say, uh, I don't know, uh, users, it's gonna be a slice uh, of strings, okay. Let's say we have AJ, uh, Melky, and Delky, right? We have this slice. Okay, we can iterate through it. We can do whatever we want. Uh, that's no problem. Appending to it, it's just we have to redeclare users, and we can do the append keyword users and put another string. So let's say uh, all clips, right? It's it's all here. Uh, oops. Okay, and then you can like iterate for over, right? Iterate over it for index. I don't know. Uh, what can we do? I don't know. It doesn't really matter. We can just for index user and then we can use the range keyword for range users 
and we can just do like something like a print f print jeez i'm tired uh these these are values right and we can do percent d plus percent s for index user all right so you can do something like this right and you can do uh clear go run main dot go there you go there you go all right so you can do something like this uh you can append a value uh yeah can you post dm it to me all cliffs dm it to me um and there's like if you want to remove a value from a slice before right so like if we wanna uh if we want to remove a value from our slice it was a pain in the ass our slice it was a pain because essentially the tldr is you would need to merge the split of the slice uh into a new into a new slice okay so what i mean by that is like if you want to remove melky which is the first index of our slice we'd basically have to split the, uh the slice into everything up to melky and everything after melky and then we join them together at the end and the syntax for that was so strange where is it um this one right here remove this is this is the uh the syntax here uh i don't remember it right it was like so we have to redeclare users right just like the append method and we can do append and then let's say we want user split join hell exactly right and we want up to the first the zeroth index so up to the first which this will cover right this the first first argument is up to up to melky first arg is up to melky right and then the second argument it is going to be users beyond melky so uh it would be to this i believe okay might even be it print line uh users i don't even know if i did it correctly let's see uh okay i did aj delki alt so i did do it correctly right first arg is up to melky uh second arg is everything after after milky string right and this is pretty obnoxious like this is kind of gross uh oh a linkedin article okay i gotta be careful how i click because i don't want to link my linkedin right so this is pretty like disgusting like i hated i hated doing this uh and to be honest there's a new package called slices so after go 121 there is this let's get back our fmt there's this slices package and um Unfortunately, right after Go 121, 121, they introduced the slices package, right? Uh, but the slices package is essentially doing this above. Uh, uh, streaming. I missed you, man. Your stream is really late, and I've been sleeping early this morning. Oh, uh, Piyush, good to see you, man. I'm happy you're able to catch a stream. I'm happy you're here to catch a stream and hang out with us. All right, so after the slices package, it's basically the same thing. You have to do users. And you have to click the slice package and then you can do slices and then delete delete and then here you go you put in your slice and then the interval of the slice so you can put our users and then the interval of our slice so here let's go ahead and um i don't know we'll have what aj we'll have aj delki all cliffs so let's say if you want to remove the last i have a reason for to force update the go version on some services yeah if you want to remove like the last index Oh, I see. Okay. If we want to remove the last index, it's like, um, actually, hold on. Let me see this again. Is it taking straight ints? Yeah, straight, straight ints. So you could be, um, it's up to an involved. So I think if there's three values, if I look at this, there's, uh, zero, one, two, I think, no, it's this. There you go. It's gonna be like this, right? And if we do format print, uh, line users, again, you can see here, we're getting rid of all cliffs. Okay, so this is what the slices package did, but essentially the slices delete function, if you look at it, it's doing the exact same thing. It's doing the exact same thing, all right? Um, so, <laughs> is it a huge kind of improvement? Like, nah, you know, nah. uh, but makes some, someone's life somewhat easier, I guess. So yeah. Slices are great. I really like the concept and some of the implementation, but let's for a whole second imagine that we might actually want to write some source code with them. Obviously, slices live in the heart of the language. They are what makes Go great. I mean, they're just 
dynamically sized arrays. All right. Uh, I'm using these. Nice. Uh, but again, let's imagine that just occasionally in between concept talks, we want to write some real code. This guy. The following code listing is how you do slice manipulation. Yeah. So this is fine. Appending. Appending is all right. Okay. Appending is all right. I, I will say it's all right. I'm, I, I don't mind the append method. It's just the, uh, I pretty love the thing. <laughs> In order to uh, copy a slice, here's what you do. Copy numbers, make lint of length numbers, copy. Yeah. Uh, believe it or not, that's how Go programmers transforms sliced every day. And we don't have any sort of generic. So you can create a pretty insert function that would hide this horror mate. I post on Playground, so you should trust me. You can double check it on your own. I mean, now there is generic. So does append create a new slice or reference or just append to the existing slice? Um, let's see. The append built-in function appends elements to the end of a slice. If it has sufficient capacity, the destination is re-sliced to accommodate the new ones. If it does not, append returns the updated slice. It is therefore necessary to store the result of append. Often, okay. I think it returns, yeah. Yep, yep. So it depends on, interesting. If it has sufficient capacity, the destination is re-sliced, yep. Yep, yep. Interesting. As a special case, it is legal to pen a string to a byte slice like this. Interesting. Okay. Uh, okay, nil interfaces are not always nil, happy face. They tell us that errors in Go are more than strings and then you shouldn't treat them as strings. For example, SPF13 from Docker said so on his adorable seven common mistakes in Go and when to avoid them talk. They also say that this guy is very passive aggressive. I will say he's extremely passive aggressive right now. Uh, they also say that I should always return error interface type, consistency, readability, etc. That's why I do in the following code listing. You'd be surprised, but this program will indeed say, hello, Mr. Pike, but is it really expected? All right, so package main import. So we have this uh, empty struct. This empty struct has this error method on it. Okay. So generate returns a reference to magic error. Okay, but it returns nil. That's fine. Okay, so generate just returns a nil for this satisfies the magic error constraint because it's a uh, the zero value of an interface is nil. Calling a nil pointer receiver method is a right of passage every go will go through. Yeah, uh, funk test error return generate. Okay. If test does not equal nil. Wait, so test, if it is not nil, hello, Mr. Pike. So this prints Mr. Pike? Why is that? I must be missing something. Yo, Bach Cooper, what's up, bro? What's going on? One of the covers interface are implemented as two elements as type T and a value V. V is a concrete value such as int, struct, or pointer, never interface itself and has type. For instance, if we store the int value three in an interface, the resulting interface value is schematically T equals int, V equals three. The value V is also known as the interface's dynamic value since a given interface variable might hold different values. What's up, BK? Yeah, it's the interface is not equal to nil value, but I thought the interface that in this code snippet.
This will become confusing and arise when a nil value is stored inside an interface value such an error return. Okay, so it's an error type. So we're assigning P, okay. I see. If all goes well, the function returns a nil. Ah, so the return value is an inner. Okay, yeah, that's where. That's why I don't. I didn't understand this because he has this error uh, return. Where is it? Here. Right. So the underlying type for this interface. is an error type. So yeah, here, if test is not equal to nil, because the type that test is returning is actually an error type. To return a proper nil error to the caller, the function must return explicit nil. Yeah, okay, I see, I see, I see, mm-hmm. You have to explicitly say nil because the zero value of this. So there's some like, okay. I, I can see that. That is a little bit confusing. Even I was kind of thrown off by this. Yeah. The interface nil problem is the most substantial gotcha. Yeah, this is this is definitely a gotcha. This is like a hundred percent. This is super confusing. My question is, what does What is this coming into play? Like if you remove this, would you get the nil value here? Yeah, so that's required for magic error to be an error, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah, if you move error, it's not error. Yeah, that's that's well that's what I said, right? Yep, yep. Cause it's satisfying the error interface. You yeah, you did, but you can't type as fast as speak. Yep. It's just a string, not error anymore, eh? What do you mean? This is a pretty interesting gotcha. This is like this is like worthy of a whole video on itself, I think. Why create generate and then test? Couldn't test just for no? can't test it just return nil it can but it's pointing how the nil value the zero value of the struct is not actually nil because this is returning a pointer reference to magic error right and the expression that the zero value of an interface should be nil but this function here is actually satisfying the error interface so it's actually being returned as an error as opposed to a nil type, like a true nil type. It's not being explicitly said as nil. That's what's happening. Yep, I'm aware of why this occurs since I read a bunch of comprehensive research about interface and how they work in Go. But for a newcomer, come on guys, it's a hammer. In fact, it's a common pitfall. As you can see, Go is such a straightforward and easy language with all the distracted features taken out. It sometimes says that nil interface is not nil. I mean, this is a pretty edge, I don't, it's not edge case, but 
Your interface is, is satisfying the value of another interface. Funny variable shadowing. Just in case, if you're not familiar with the term, let me quote Wikipedia. Variable shadowing occurs when a variable declared within a certain scope, decision, block, method, or inner class has the same name as a variable declared in an outer scope. Seems legit, quite a common practice. Most language support variable shadowing, and it's just fine. Go is not an exception, yet it's different. That's how shadowing works here. Okay, what's going on here? We have, okay, import. So we have func secret. We have int and error, return 42, nil. Okay, okay. So number, okay, print before, okay. Ah. I can see this. Is this still a, is this still the case? Up at the scope of this? Mm -hmm. Yeah, because it's, it's declared here in this scope block. And there you go, right? Yes, I'm aware that also the opera creates a new variable and assigns a right-hand value to it. So according to language spec, it's an absolute legit behavior. But here's a funny thing. Try removing the inner scope. It'll work just expect after 42. Otherwise, say hello to variable shout. Yeah, that's what we just tested. I also don't know what's weird about this. This is like you're, you're closing the scope about this. Exactly. It's just scoping. What is weird about this? Like, could you make the webcam smaller? It's high in the text. Yeah, sure. I can only move it that much. I don't want to move it more. So. It's being redeclared, not assigned. Yeah, so if you go back to, like I just pasted his code here. Um, oops, not that, that's the course. Yeah, here, so we have this number zero, we're printing it, we're printing after, so we'll get, ze we'll get 0, 42, 42, right? I mean, 0, 40, 0, 42, 0, there you go. So before it's zero, we don't assign anything, so it's still zero, uh, but then we have this scope where we're redeclaring number as secret, right? So we get this return value from our secret function, and then, the only thing he's tripping about is because they're both called number, right? That's the only thing I think he's tripping about. So I think you could maybe do something like this. Let's see. Will this cause anything to go crazy? Numbers unused. Yeah, okay. So it's still scoped. Okay, I thought that was going to reassign it, but it doesn't. Yeah. It might cause when you do... Yep, yep, exactly. That's what I was thinking. And then you can reassign a number. You can do, do number like 100, right? So now we'll get 0, 42, 100. That would be hell to debug in large code bases. Yeah. Yeah. So I mean, this this makes sense. I mean, just like. Right. You just call this another number, and then. Zero in step with number forty-two zero zero. I, I'm not tripping, right? This this seems pretty decent. This seems pretty normal. <laughs> like I'm not like this. If I see this code, I would expect the number would be forty-two, and then outside of the scope of this. And if you look, if you remove this, right? If you remove this, it's zero forty-two forty-two, because we've reassigned number up here to be the output of secret, which is going to be returning 42. And there you go. Yep. I don't know. Okay. Maybe we're missing something, but I think this is, uh, a sh uh, uh this is not a good point. Uh, I need to say, it's not just some funny example I came up with during lunch. It's a real thing people run into eventually. I've been refactoring some Go code earlier this week and run to it twice. Compilers fine. Linters are fine. Everybody's fine. Code is not working. You can't pass a struct as interface. 
Interface is great, Pike and Co. Keep on saying that it's what Go is. Interface is how you work around generics. It's how you do mock testing. It's the way polymorphism... Don't even shout if I don't understand it. it. Wait, it's the way polymorphism implemented. Tell you, I love the interface with my heart right while reading Effective Go, and I keep on loving them. Except this nil interface is not nil issue. I addressed above. There's another nasty thing which makes me think that interfaces do not have a first class support in Go. Well, okay, guys, this, this article is also eight years ago eight years long, uh, old. Basically, you can't pass a slice of structs that satisfy some interface to a function receiving a slice of this interface type. Yo, what's up? Uh, why are we on about an eight-year article? I think it's just fun to... I want to read it for a while. So let's see. So we have x fancy int string. Okay. Literally any object with string. That's what I'm saying. Foo force. That's why I like. It doesn't matter if this thing is eight years old. I mean, Go hasn't changed that much. Okay, so we have a list. We have a slice of fancy ints. One, two, three, four, five. Okay. And we have runes. Runes is fancy rune. Okay. Literally any object with string method. Okay. So we have string, 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 string. Sounds seems good. String made up of string representation of items given. So items is a slice of interfaces. This is kind of weird. <laughs> a slice of interfaces. <laughs> I think that defeats the purpose of interfaces. No, like I don't think that's how interfaces are meant to be used. An interface is a collection of method signatures. It's not like an underlying data type. Yeah, he wants to treat interface an explicit type. That's what this, what, like, this is what that means. <clears throat> I just never, I've never seen anything like this. So proper numbers, he's making a slice of these interfaces, length of numbers. Okay. For I and number, range numbers, proper number I is number. Okay. Interesting. You have to recast it to a list of interface and then send it. Yeah, interesting. You have to recast it. That's what he's doing here, right? He's recasting it. So each number in the range of numbers is just this fancy, fancy int. Did you see slice error? No, where was that? Where is that? Interface used as the any type, but you can't have a slice of mixed types, so it's a contrived example. Mm -hmm. uh, if they just wrapped in a struct, then you can pass it or give it the wrapped struct method or use an interface as a param. I mean, this is just kind of strange. This this kind of facilitation, but. Unsurprising, this is a known issue, which is not considered an issue at all. It's just a yet another funny thing about Go, all right? I I'll really recommend you to read a related wiki on point. You'd find out why the passing struct slice as interface slice won't work. But hey, just think about it. We can do this. There's no magic. It's just a compiler issue. Look, I did an explicit conversion from struct to interface on lines 49 to 57, right? 
Why can't Go Compiler do this for me? Yeah, explicit is better than implicit, but what the fuck? I just can't stand how people look at this as sort of bullshit and language is full of... I keep saying, ah, yeah, it's just fine. It's not. It's what makes Go a horrible language. I mean, dude, why are you so upset? I can kind of see the slight inconvenience of this, right? I can't, I can't see the slight inconvenience way of this. Like you'd think just like, if you've never written Go, this should kind of make, make sense. Where if you have join, which is just expecting like a slice of the stringy interface, right? And you have all these fancy ints, which implement that string method, which should satisfy the interface constraint, the interface uh, method signature. You think you could do this, but all you have to do is just explicitly It's on medium. <laughs> I mean, you know, I kind of see it's pretty non-obvious range of value loops. This first language I ever encountered. All right, so there's four range loop and go. It's there to range over slice and listen to channels. It's used everywhere and it's just fine. Here's still a minor issue though. Most newcomers keep on failing on range loops are by value only. It copies values and that's it. You can't really do anything about it. It's not for each from C++. So we have this slice of integers, we range over them, we increase the values, it's the same thing. It's the same thing. Wasn't this fixed? I think this was fixed in Go version 122, right? The range thing? Yeah, this did change in 122. 122, so we can't, we can't blame him for this. This is, a, this is a valid one, right? This is a lot of people had issues with this uh, for loop passing the actual copy of the uh, the slice in the, I guess, context of closure of the for loop instantiation. So I can see this one. Questionable compiler rigidity. As I told you before, Go is considered a clear, simple, and readable language with a strict compiler. For instance, you can't compile a program with an unused import. Why? It's just because Mr. Pike thinks it's right. Believe it or not, unused import is not the end of the world. I can totally with it. Uh, this is not a like I think this is fine wait what are you saying it's still not creating for a reference this would still apply would it let's see let's play around with it Hmm, interesting. Cause it's not pa it's not actually creating a new reference of it, yep. An interesting should not modify the original, that would be weird. Yeah, true, true. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, so I totally missed this. I thought these were the same thing, but I missed it here. Uh, okay, so number is not a reference to... Uh, how, do I, how do I write this? A number is not a reference to... I guess the best way is to numbers at I, right? The, uh, the actual allocated value allocated memory value memory value in the slice 
right? So we're only incrementing the scope of the for loop, right? We're only incrementing the copy of it. C++ devs would be pissed, right? But here we're actually modifying. Interesting, why, you know, this one is kind of cool. Go believe most of the time do ops by value. Now, I do not complain about go missing by reference ranges. I complain about range being not obvious. Verb range kind of says iterate over items. It doesn't really say iterate over item copies. Let's take a look at four from effective go. It says nothing like range copies values from the slice. It just doesn't. I agree that's a minor issue. I got over pretty quickly, but unexperienced gopher might spend time debugging a chunk of code, wondering why a value is not changed. You guys could at least elaborate the point in effective go. Can you print the addresses of number numbers on the first loop? Yes, I can. The second one, you're modifying the actual value to memory address. Yeah, this one you're not. Exactly, that's what I'm saying. This one, we're not allocating the actual memory address of, hold on, music stopped. Here, we're not modifying the actual memory address of the number, okay? Print the address of number and numbers i. In the which loop? Yeah, it's not pointer traversal, but here we're actually in this one. We're a, we are actually let's go here. Uh, we can even do it here, right? Like we just put number. Um, uh, You can see they're all different. Uh, let me make it more obvious. Oh, whoops. Uh, Addy of copy, and this is Addy of the actual ref to the slice on line. What line is this? Line six. Yeah, so add the copy at the actual, yeah, so there are different addresses, right? So the first instance, when you create the scope of, when you range over the numbers, you're creating a copy of the actual number. Whereas with the actual indexing of the value, you are getting the actual memory address of the value instantiated in the numbers uh, slice. Yo, what's up, Kartash? Yo, I'm gonna use the washroom, we are back.
So I'm back. A copy to a variable in the stack or optimize out, I imagine if you don't reference and it'll end up in the register directly. <clears throat> it's a, yeah, well, we know it's a, I just proved it's a copy. Wait, someone's saying it's not a copy. We just proved it. The, the memory address, this is, we can see here. Um, you know what we can do? Let's actually shorten the slice because it's going to just be a little messy. So let's go here. Let's shorten the slice and then let's do uh, format that print line and let's print the address of numbers at the zeroth index. Okay. And then here, it's something you learn once you get burned by it. The way I learned about pointers and references, it wasn't through for loops, it's actually through structs and the pointer references like that. So I want, when I want to modify a struct by passing it a by passing as a copy to a function or something like that, or even calling a method on a non pointer reference to my struct. And I wasn't modifying the field. That's when I'm like, wait, what the fuck is going on? How long is your pointer PP? I don't even, okay. Why are we listening to this like bangers from like 2005? What? If it's a slice of struck, you're still going to pass it by copy. You're still going to pass it a copy. Even if a slice of struck, you're going to pass it a copy. If you don't explicitly state that it's going to be either a pointer or reference to a pointer, you're going to be passing copies. Okay. So here, if we look at the verse list, um, Yeah, so you can see here, this is all we need. Oh, whoops. Okay, so here we have the address of the zeroth index, right? 6010. This is the address of the copy, and this is the address of the actual value. There you go. So that's it. So we know that when you iterate through this, we're passing a copy. So the range loop, let's actually see this. Oh, we can't see the definition of the keyword range. Interesting. I would like to see this. Okay. So the question compiler, this one's kind of funny about like the unused imports. I mean, Oh my God, your gift got approved, bro. That's such an old gif. Uh, this does illustrate a point I think of when people talk about how easy Go is. You still need to understand pointers in a way you don't even have in others. Yeah. Exactly. There is still that this gotcha with pointers and references that nobody talks about. Or very few people talk about, I suppose. Right? Very few people talk about this kind of gotcha when it comes to Go. Go generate is too quickly. I don't even know that. Okay. What? Well, okay. Overall, like I'm not too, I'm not too starched on this article. This guy still is using it, but uh, it's also inconsistent behavior of the call set for method calls as they implicitly indirect to a pointer. If the method definition receiver type is a pointer. To a pointer if the method definition receiver type is a pointer. If the receiver is a pointer, then wait, hold on, what? Wait, what? Let me let me try and follow along here. If we have type person struck, right? Let's just say it has a name string. Okay, let's say we have like funk p person uh change name okay we just do p dot name cool. calls and methods look the same either way yeah wait hold on let me i this song is terrible 
why am I losing that? That song was awful. Okay, so here, and if we just create something, that's what I mean by being burnt. What do you mean? Hold on. Am I understanding something? If we have like a uh, new person. And we just call a uh, new person. Let's say uh, foo force, right? Kafka connect. That was pretty wild. There was one little issue I saw in the article, and that was mostly because of duck tape typing in Frisco. A confusing thing, not a bug. Wait, so he means in the range function. So, oh, you mean in the range function? I see. I thought the method call. I got, gotcha. What extension are you using for Vim key bindings? Um, I am using just the Vim extension, the regular ones that's provided by um, VS Code. I have a YouTube video on this. I mean the error thing at the beginning, all the rest is normal. Uh, is it a good idea to learn Go after one year of experience as a Java junior developer? Yeah, why not? I mean, I think maybe the question is why do you wanna learn Go? Right, if you're already learning Java for one year, why, why do you wanna learn Go? What's up speedy Astro? Why not? Well, that's the thing. You don't wanna just learn things just for the sake of learning them. Like I always think you should learn things with a purpose. And like, that's an opinion people always like, like TJ would disagree with me, right? He's like, it's okay to learn things. So it makes you better. Like, yeah, sure. Um, but I'm like, I kind of think of it like, I don't want to waste my time learning something that I'm never going to use. Maybe I can extract something and squeeze something out of that learning. But like, I personally want to learn something if I'm going to use it. The slice thing is valid. Everything is too minor. I learned it from a go came from TypeScript. Oh, nice. Cool. Um, that signs. Okay. Okay, this is a fine article. Nothing too crazy. Nothing too crazy. Whatever. Uh, I'm not like, you know, I kind of expected more. But let's see this. Tree. The harsh reality of actually, you know what? Learn go for the jokes, why Iota? Yo, Milkman, spin faction now, learn useful things. Yep. Your job is getting rid of Scala? Wait, what? Why is your job getting rid of Scala? And replacing with Go? Those seem like they should be able to address two completely different things, no? Do you retire type level engineers? I see. Did Monkey talk about my question? I got two 40s ads in a row after he read my comment. Really? That sucks. Sorry about that. What was your comment, Azizul? Oh, yeah, we talked about this. Um, you definitely like, my question is why do you wanna learn go? Like why do you wanna learn, after you're one year into Java, why do you wanna learn go? I like the go simplicity and finally understood pointers and concurrency after I started coding go. Yeah. YouTube chat popping off. Let's go YouTube chat. Yeah, I think that's a good reason to learn it. If you're gonna build something with Go, like all the power to you, bro. Join the trend and read the Go manual. <laughs> nah. I am not gonna read the Go manual. Look at this. Yo, what's up, Bio Digital Jazz? You think I'm gonna read all this? Bro, no way. Not a chance.
I understand that, but I just don't have the time to want to do that. 2,000 subs. If you read all, I'll donate 1K when you're done. No, I don't even believe you. you up front. Up front, 1,000, and I'll do it. Let's see. What's this? Uh, person struck. Yeah. Print name. Okay, so here we're assigning that the P of a reference person is nil. Okay, because the nil value of a pointer is nil. We can do p dot print name. So print name. If p does not equal to nil, well, we already understood that this would be. It's gonna say p name, right? Actually, let's see. Let's run this. Damn, it's not, it's not BIM, shite. Yeah, it's gonna say hello, yeah. It will just say hello. This is gonna error out. It's calling the person print name P, so no issue here. Since we're not trying to dereferencing P anywhere, P print world is like person print world P. Results in panic. Interesting. Yo, what's up, Stone Hat? If P does not equal to nil, right? Right. Because it's not truly a nil. Yeah. It's interesting. This is a pretty good catch. Go language witnessed get goad um okay we could what do you guys want to watch how did master web development actually get a job <laughs> this fucking nonsense or the harsh reality of good software this is the spec yeah no let's not read the spec i just have a bunch of stuff queued in dude this guy keeps going at it he keeps making videos and yo he calls himself out Yo, what's up, Viginity 3S? First up on my channel? Hell yeah. That's awesome. I use Ubuntu. I use Ubuntu. Uh, also, top of the hour Discord plug. If you guys haven't already, join the Discord. We are absolutely killing it. It's fun in there. Anime nights, etc. nights. It's all it's all fun stuff in there. Body catcher. Who is this? The new junior tech lead? Yeah, exactly. Uh, already one plug in the description. So it says, yo, this guy is actually kind of a hypocrite. Look at this. So let's switch. Okay, we don't need this. Okay, let me know if you guys can hear the, can you guys hear this? Mastering full stack development is still the fastest way for any average person to break into the tech industry today. But as we are all aware, the tech market is not very easy right now. Can you guys hear it? W and chat can hear it or not. Mastering full stack development is still. I'm Mr. Body Catcher. Start a gang, so snatcher. I know anyone. F one fifty. So fucking raptor. Okay, so. This is, yeah, this is a giant L. I am not a fan of this individual whatsoever. I've made plenty of video, videos about him in the past. We are and uh, he basically talks for 15 minutes without actually saying anything. So there's one video, people dumber than you are getting rich with coding. How to master Python fast in 2024, full roadmap. How I would learn data structure and algorithm in 2024. Is this the end of self-taught programmer, etc. Okay. So I want you to all witness what he's going to say in the very first part of this video. Look at this very, like the first, let's say minute. All right. 
Mastering full stack development is still the fastest way for any average person to break into the tech industry today. But as we are all aware, the tech market is not very easy right now, which means that the days of simply learning HTML, CSS and JavaScript and landing a 100k job without a degree are over. And he literally had a video in his course that was saying if you take his course, you can get a $120,000 job in six months. He took that video down because I absolutely murked him on it. Um, but that was the case. He literally promoted something that said, I, I have a video, I have proof of this. I literally have proof of this on my video. Hold on. If I go to my channel and I go to, you know, view your channel, videos, where is it? Uh, what video was it? Fuck. Concentration. Discipline. Wait, no, no, no. Is it where, where? Which one was it? It was tech is a scam. Tech is a scam. I'm gonna be okay. talking to you about a huge problem that's spreading across all of this guy. So I'm talking oh, about this God. dude again, and okay. bang, it's because right here, Landy. Literally, he says this. Yo, literally, he says this in this fucking video. I land a one hundred thousand dollar software engineer job in six months without a CS degree, even if you have never written a line of code before but what does he say in the first 20 seconds of his video mastering full stack development is still the fastest way for any average person to break into the tech industry today but as we are all aware the tech market is not very easy right now which means that the days of simply learning html css and javascript and landing a 100k job without a degree are over and this so what happened here so what happened here? This is two months ago. He took the video down, by the way. He took the video down because he saw my video. He saw this video where I called him out and he, he took it down, right? Because I'm like, this is actually insane. And now he's playing, he's like doing reverse psychology where he's like, wait, watch out for these scouts. Listen to this, wait, listen to this. Everyone, guys, actually shut the fuck up for a second. Listen to, listen to the next part. This part blew my mind. There's still way too much BS advice that doesn't recognize this reality, but there is still hope. It's simply BS advice that doesn't talk about this reality. And there's still way too much BS advice that doesn't recognize this reality, but there is still hope. It's simply bro. I, I want you to literally watch this video intermate coder. And I want you to really realize what I'm about to say. You are the BS advice in the tech community, all right? Like you are what you are trying to talk about right here. There's no like nothing about what you say actually provides substance to your viewers. And you are continuously scamming them with all of your different courses. I've just showed an experiment where you are trying to do your python course but ever since i made this video two months ago you have since released a data structures video or course and you're plugging another one zero to mastery 60 coding courses for less than one dollar per day and you are plugging each and every single one of your courses here from alga university all right so i really want you to take a deep look into the mirror when you are going to make a new video and understand what you do in the tech viewer tech space because i'm pretty sure at this point your reputation has basically been ruined and uh i don't think you're going to really get out of this if you keep making these kinds of nonsense videos simply the case that what it means to become a web developer worthy of getting a job in this market is different to what it was before so in this video i'm going to give you the fastest updated path to learn web development from zero, including all the topics that you actually need to learn today and how to do it as fast as possible in 2024 and beyond so that you can still land a job and stand out in this crowd. Oh yeah, he, so as fast as, I'm gonna teach you what you actually need to know, all right? I know that so many engineers are teaching you BS because the days of HTML, CSS, and JavaScript to get a 100K job are over. But me, I'm gonna teach you what you actually need to know in the fastest time to actually get a job in this market.
Why? Because I'm making this video. Do I have any credentials to back anything I say up? Absolutely not. But this video has nice editing. It has nice music transitions. So you have to listen to me. Crowded market, even if you're self-taught and even if you don't have any previous experience. But before we can get into that, as well as the way that you can actually do this much faster than you might think, like in as little as three to six months. I fucking hate this. These expectations are one of the root causes of people not actually going into this um, into this field. Because you have the assholes like him who say, hey, you don't need to ever write a single line of code, but with my help, you can do it in three to six months. And there's people who believe this, right? There's people who believe this, and then they actually go in, buy this course, and the worst part isn't the fact that they just made this guy money. It's that in three to six months, when they're not at where they should be, obviously getting a job, they actually go down on themselves. They blame themselves as the issue, okay? It's like, oh man, I didn't. I still don't have a job. It's been three to six months. I must just be bad. It must be me. But the nonsense is that this kind of false pretense is so toxic and dangerous for anybody to be listening to that you should not even position in yourself to buy this course and have these expectations. Especially from this fucking guy. Even today, we do need to talk about why specifically web development is what you should choose. All right, so let's start with the basics, which is why. Why do we want to learn I web development over different whatever. types of development, like mm. iOS development or developing mm. the software for... You know what's crazy? Hold on. Before... I want you guys to call me out. You guys know I'm going to be making a course, right? I'm dropping a course for front-end masters. Look what I say in my slides. I want you guys to call me out. Uh, this is my course that I'm doing. And literally, I say here, second slide, I make mistakes. There will be mistakes. We'll solve the mistakes together. I then say, wait for it. Uh, two, 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 two. Why this course is not There's no hitting expectation. It's not perfect. You're not going to be a pro, a go, or AWS. And you'll probably end up doing things differently than I do. And that's really good. Okay? My course that I'm doing, because I'm so adamant about these topics, is literally saying, you're not going to be a pro in this field. You are not going to be good at this. But what you what I want you to do is pick up these terms and go on your own and challenge why I'm teaching you these things, right? Target audience. Everyone wants to learn Go. And always ask why this is done and why is it the way that it is. And I'm literally telling you, look at the resources, look at the documentation. Don't just take me, okay? Don't just take my advice. Even though I'm the instructor, don't just take my advice. So something like that. Well, the reason is, is that for you, if you want to get a job as fast as possible, what we want is ideally best returns, AKA higher salaries and most amount of jobs available for the lowest possible effort. Web development happens to be probably the easiest area of programming to get into as a beginner. I don't even need to say anything about that. I don't even, I don't even need to say anything about that. Um, if you believe this, you need to watch more of my streams. Literally, if you are coming and you're going to try and defend this dude, uh, you need to watch more of my streams and uh, buckle down and uh, get hit with some real dose of reality. The world doesn't work like this. Nothing's fucking easy, especially now. You know? AKA to get into the industry, you need to learn the least. You just need to learn a couple of basics, which will. I can't believe he just said that. I can't believe he just said that. Get a job as fast as possible. What we want is ideally best returns, AKA higher salaries and most amount of jobs available for the lowest possible effort. Web development happens to be probably the easiest area of programming to get into as a beginner, aka to get into the industry, you need to learn the least. You just need to learn a couple of basics, which we'll talk about in a second. I got a comment on this, dude. I'm, I'm actually sick of this. These videos are literally trash. I cannot believe you try to teach people that all they need to do is learn the basics and that 
web dev is easy web dev is easy you have clearly never worked in any production environment period period and only create your scam courses i am so upset that you continue to create these continue to create this content this type of content like <laughs> it's it is brutal i'm i'm debating i'm gonna let this sink a little bit i'm gonna let this sink a bit maybe maybe i'm too fuming but despite of that unlike many other things in life where usually it's like the more you learn the higher the returns and things exactly. like that exactly exactly run chill i'm gonna let it out i feel good writing it out it's out i'm not gonna post it right let's gonna let the emotion i don't want to be too emotional we're, gonna be, we're business here development you also get the highest possible salaries and the most amount of jobs available despite the fact that it is the easiest to learn because of the fact that in the world in general there is simply a lot of demand for web things companies need websites startups need web apps websites need to be maintained for corporations like right now you're watching this video on youtube.com that is a website that has been built by web developers and you bet that youtube.com is making a lot of money which means that they have a lot of demand for web developers <laughs> is this point really the fact that because you were watching youtube on a browser and youtube is making a lot of money that you are going to make a lot of money as a web developer is that really his point yo usually hi Usually high. I think uh, I think I gotta send the heavy artillery here, man. I think uh, you know what? I think I gotta send the best, the heaviest hitters on the Melky squad, and that's uh, the motherfucker. Usually high. I think usually high. If you're still in chat, I think you gotta do your thing. So then how do we get started with learning web development? Well, this is obviously going to depend and there's going to be different options that are right for different budget levels. What you can However bad you think your comment is, just remember the damage this guy's doing. The fact is, here's my real problem with him. I hate the fact that he's doing damage, but he's also like making money off of this. That's the part that I hate the most. If you're just some dude spewing nonsense on the internet, whatever you can make we live in a free time where you can basically say make any video you want but he plugs his he creates this like he basically creates this like ponzi scheme environment where he gives you these pieces to believe what you're about to do is easy but you're just misguided and then he's going to plug his course as that missing guiding piece and he benefits financially from it while you were just in the same spot like let me actually see something let me sort by the newest comments. Amazing video, bro. Please change your transition effect. Can absolutely start with is simply by going on YouTube and following different web development tutorials that you will find. Or you could go and take on a full $10,000 coding bootcamp that is in person that with like a full curriculum or something like that. That is going to be right for someone. But again, what you're probably looking for is the best bang for buck. And I believe the best bang for buck platform out there for learning programming is Zero to Mastery. Now, I've been a partner with Zero to Mastery since like, the is. beginning stage of is. my Buy my course. Zero to Mastery was actually yep. one of the platforms where I... Yo, usually high. We need you, bro. We need to send the heavy artillery against this guy. We got to tech with Tim him. I, I got to send you in, bro. I got to send you in. I personally learned to code myself, but I especially recommend... Yeah, the, the Melky squad, we have, we have this dude. This is, this is our hit, man. This is usually high. For, for those who don't know, Usually high is the uh, the heaviest artillery we have in our arsenal. The savage of savages, all right?
recommend is their full w web and chat development usually high that essentially takes you through everything you need to learn from front-end development, back-end development, DevOps, and you can access the entire course as well as the 60 plus other courses that they have in their platform for a single subscription where the price is less than a cup of coffee per day. But it doesn't even end there because on top of their courses, they also have a full support community with over 400,000 fellow students who you can learn alongside and keep you accountable. They also have full project related courses where you literally build out a project as you go through the course and i'm actually developing my own project course. oh there it is build a notion clone to react and typescript course for them as well so you'll have that to look forward to in the near future so if that sounds like a good deal to you you can get an even better deal by using my code friends10 right there so go and sign up down below so that takes care of where do we start next we need to talk about what are the actual topics that you need to master to get enough knowledge in web development to actually get hired so let's talk about that so your first step will be to learn html css and javascript and i know you might be saying like oh didn't you say right at the start of the video that learning html css and javascript isn't enough i did say that and it is not enough to learn these topics but you should still start with them because html css and javascript is still the foundation of web development trying to go and learning react or some like fancy frameworks before you've even learned the react or fancy frameworks no other framework mentioned these basics it's sort of like trying to go and learn a calculus without learning the basics of addition and subtraction first so what are html css and javascript so let's think about for example this web page that you're viewing right now where you have this video playing so what are the different components that make up this web page well first of all we have the actual content so we have the text that you can see below this video you have the titles of the videos that you see on the right hand side with the suggested videos and that information has been defined using html and you can actually view the raw html of this very web page if you're on google chrome and you right click and then you go to the bottom and you click on inspect that will show you the raw html tree and if you click on the different components you'll be able to click down to for example where it actually defines the text that it goes into the description so that is html it defines the actual content on the page okay so what else do we see on this page well of course the web page is a lot more than just the raw text and the content when it's on the page we also care about what the page looks like we like the fact that my youtube channel for example has the icon on it we like that the like button looks the way that it looks like the like button so the way that the web page looks like is defined using css which stands for cascading style sheets the final component that makes up this web page is any interactive elements that you'll see so for example whenever you click on the like button you're going to see this little animation show up which you can test right now by the way by clicking on it just for illustrative purposes you know all of that inter um <clears throat> activity within the page is taken care of by javascript code so these three pieces html css and javascript make up the basic is taken care of by wait wait a second Wait a second. That's not JavaScript logo. This isn't the JavaScript logo. <laughs> dude, I've been saying this, dude. I've been fucking saying this. This guy's never watching his own videos. This is not the fucking JavaScript logo, bro. This is my first time watching Mokka Stream and I think I joined at a good time. Probably team makes it or Fiverr. Yeah, and he doesn't even watch it. So you're really gonna listen and learn from a guy who's teaching you web dev when he can't even edit in the properly generated picture for what he's talking about? Because talking about HTML3 and JS, let's see. Hold on, hold on. 
I'm pretty sure that's not true. I'm pretty sure he goes into steps. He first talks about HTML and there's the HTML logo. He then talks about CSS and the cascading style sheets. And then he talks about JavaScript. The interactive elements that you see. So for example, whenever you click on the like button, you're gonna see this little animation show up, which you can test right now, by the way, by clicking on it, just for illustrative purposes, you know? All of that interactivity within the page is taken care of by JavaScript code. So these three pieces, HTML, CSS and JavaScript make up the basics of what make up a web page. And this used to be what web development was. But as the industry and as these technologies have evolved, we have realized that simply writing raw HTML, CSS, and JavaScript can be quite pedantic. So we have written something called frameworks on top of these technologies to make this whole process easier. So let's talk about that. All right, so after you learn the basics of HTML, CSS, and JavaScript, I want you to move on to frameworks. And this is where we are sort of dividing up our efforts into the back end and the front end of the web. So front end is what we just learned about essentially. And this is all the stuff that you actually see on the web page. Now there is actually another side of the web, which is called the back end, which is like the logical sort of behind the scenes stuff that happens. Like you might be wondering, for example, where did you actually get this video file that you're watching right now? When you logged into your YouTube account, where is this data stored? Like all of these kind of things. Like when you pay for something, where does the actual payment processing happen? Like all of this is what's happening in the back end. So somewhere out there in the world, Google has some computers where they have specific programs called the server running that take care of all of these details. Now you could do all of this simply using a raw programming language like Python or JavaScript or Java, but to make this easier for us, programmers somewhere out there in the world have developed something called backend frameworks to essentially take care of a lot of this for us. So when you're learning backend, what you need to do is just choose one backend framework. And this is gonna depend on the programming language that you wanna use in the backend. You can use any language. Python, Java, JavaScript, and all of them are going to have their own backend frameworks that essentially do all of the same things. This is like just niche differences and some are better for some purposes and things like this. Really, it does. Did you say the differences in backend frameworks is niche purposes? So I want to play that just to see what he was talking about. And I literally cannot understand what he said. I don't know what he just said. Doesn't matter. Just can you upvote my comment? Yeah. Sort by newest. Which one is it? You're not here. Hey bro, I bought one of your courses that promised me to get 100k in six months, but now you're saying that's not possible. I guess I'll buy this new course instead. I appreciate everything you do, bro. You seem to really know what you're talking about. <laughs> All right, I gotta use the washroom. Hold on, I I need to like actually like vomit. I'll be right back. You guys, usually hi, you're in charge.
All right. Are we back for this? Let's go. Choose one backend framework. For example, on Zero to Mastery, they have a course on Node.js, which is a great choice because given that you have now on, the go back. backend, go back. which is like the I gotta go back on to frameworks. And this is where we are sort of dividing up our efforts into the back end and the front end of the web. So front end is what we just learned about essentially. And this is all the stuff that you actually see on the web page. Now there is actually another yeah, side of the web, which is stuff. called the back end, which is like the logical sort of behind the scenes stuff. The logical that happens. Back like you logical. might be wondering, for example, where did you actually get this video file that you're watching right now? When you logged into your YouTube account, where is this data stored? Like all of these kind of things. Like when you pay for something, where does the actual payment processing happen? Like all of this is what's happening in the back end. So somewhere mm -hmm. out there in the world, mm -hmm. Google has some computers where they have specific programs called the server running that so i don't think i need to replay this but i'm gonna replay it a third time um if you've ever had doubts and understand like well you know does he know what the, what he's talking about i think this is like really all i need to display here Payment processing happen. Like all of this is what's happening in the back end. So somewhere out there in the world, Google has some computers where they have specific programs called the server. So they have specific programs called the server running that take care of all of these details. Yo, what's up, now, Nate? You could do all of this simply using a raw programming language like Python or JavaScript or Java. But to yeah, make this course. easier for us, most programmers it. somewhere out there in the world the have most developed something it. called backend frameworks to essentially take care of a lot of this for us. So when you're learning backend, what you need to do Nate is Ray. just choose one backend framework. And this can is going to depend on Nate. the programming language that you want to use in the backend. You can use any language. Python, Java, JavaScript, and all of them are going to have their own backend frameworks that essentially do all of the same things. This is like just niche differences. Niche differences. Some are better for some purposes and things like this. Really, it doesn't matter. Just choose one back. I bet you this guy can't even tell you what one of the niche differences is between choosing a backend programming framework. Can framework, for example, on Zero to Mastery, they have a course on Node.js, which is a great choice because given that you have now learned JavaScript, simply using the same language, you can also develop in the backend using the Node.js JavaScript runtime and the Express framework on top of it. And then on the front end, yeah, oh, you just called it Ultrafy. You literally just called it. He definitely used Express. Like, bro, that was crazy. You called him out. Phenomenal. Side. While you can build great websites simply using HTML, CSS, and JavaScript, nowadays we don't really write raw HTML, CSS, and JavaScript anymore. Usually we will use. We don't. HTMX? HTMX, baby. Use a front end framework, like for example, React, which is the most popular one, that essentially combines HTML, CSS, and JavaScript in such a way that it's much easier to write, much more like quicker to update the pages and things like this. So in this step, you want to learn a front end framework and a back end framework. And I want you to try to move on to this step as fast as possible. I know it's tempting to like try to learn all the details of JavaScript and like all the CSS syntax and all of this. All of that, in my opinion, is a complete waste of time. We'll talk more in a second why that is. But essentially, all the syntax is something that you'll just build up as you go. As soon as you understand sort of the basics and the ideas and the concepts behind this, you can just move on to learning these frameworks. And after you've learned the basics of one front-end and back-end framework, we can get into the next step, which is going to be DevOps. So DevOps might sound like a scary word. Well, actually, it is kind of scary if you really go into the rabbit hole of DevOps. But essentially, it's just talking about like all the infrastructure around making our website work so let's say you learn react and you learn django in the back end how do we what what a what a setup eh react and django so let's say you learn react and you learn react and django stack that's gnarly learn django in the back end how do we so this dude went from learning html css javascript basics with the wrong javascript logo in the video and look at this. If you guys are just coming in, check this out. So he was making a video. Look at this. In his own video, I don't know the timestamp. He was talking about JavaScript. He showed the CSS3 logo. He literally showed the CSS3 logo. He was talking about JavaScript. And he just showed this. So, I mean, clearly he's very knowledgeable, right? And then we speed ran 
talk about frameworks, but we somehow talk about backend frameworks as well. So I think React is is a backend framework now, whatever. But then he's also saying you can speed through the basics to go straight into the framework, but don't jump right into the framework because he thinks those details are not necessary, but you should still do them. And then all of that, you should can then nosedive into DevOps. Okay, I'm keeping up, I'm keeping up. Connect the React front end to the Django bucket. That's DevOps. How do we... That's DevOps? Connecting the front end to the back end is DevOps? Hold up, nah, this guy said some crazy shit. This guy said some crazy shit. This one could be the craziest. DevOps might sound like a scary word. Well, actually it is kind of scary if you really go into the rabbit hole of DevOps, but essentially it's just talking about like all the infrastructure around making our website work. So let's say you learn React and you learn Django in the backend. How do we connect the React front end to the Django backend? That's DevOps. Wow. Wow. I've been doing DevOps wrong my whole life. How do we connect our backend to a database where we, for example, want to store or information about our users and things like this? That is going to be DevOps. How do we maintain our code? How do we update our code? So you might have heard of about tools like Git or GitHub, that is going to be DevOps. <laughs> Yo, I people have been giving me shit for being mean to this guy. I hope this video strengthens my case as to why I do this. I really hope now everyone understands why I am the way I am to this guy. That is insane. We want to store information about our users and things like this. That is going to be DevOps. How do we maintain our code? It's all DevOps. Everything is DevOps. How do we update our code? So you might have heard about tools like Git or GitHub. That is going to be. Watch this picture. <laughs> be DevOps. Really, you want to learn just the basics around a couple of these links like Git, GitHub, as well as how to deploy your website. So that just essentially means how do you actually get the website that you code to show up somewhere on the web using a URL that anyone can navigate to. Once you do that, you now have all the skills to build a fully fledged website, which means that your next step is going to just start building as fast as possible. I think the real new way to learn full stack development as fast as possible is not to like obsess over all the details or like learning every detail about every language and these frameworks. In fact, that never really was the way anyway. The way you learn this stuff fast is that you learn just the basics, just enough to start building. And then you just start building as uncomfortable as it sounds for you. Because the thing is that learning programming or any coding topic is almost like learning to ride a bike. You're not going to learn to ride a bike by reading a book about learning to ride a bike. Sure, you're going to have to learn the basics of like the mechanics of how to like pedal and like all these kind of things. But the real way to learn to ride a bike, bike is riding? just to it's ride DevOps. a bike yeah, as yeah. much as possible. And that is the same thing with coding. So what same I want thing. you to set for yourself as a challenge, as soon as you've gone through like That's a DevOps. course or whatever you're doing, just pick up any project that you really want to build using code and just start going through it step by step where you figure out how to do each individual part as you go through the project. That is what I found to be by far the best way to learn. And that will also allow you to then have projects that you can put in your resume and actually show to potential employers to prove to them that you actually know how to code. This is the way that we can stand out in this industry, even above people who have degrees and things like this. So now that we understand what we need to learn today to actually call ourselves full stack developers. <laughs> <laughs> so
So I, I actually can't stop giggling. I can't stop giggling. Um, this is this this is crazy. This my GitHub DevOps. Riding a bike DevOps. Making YouTube videos DevOps. Sound overwhelming to you? Like all this, all these things that I will have to learn. But the thing is that as much as the stuff you have to learn to break in has increased, learning these things has also become much easier. But you need to know what you're doing. And this is what gets us into how do you do this fast? And this is all about becoming what I call the AI driven developer. We have ChatGPT, we have a GitHub Copilot, we have all these AI tools that can aid us in writing a lot of code. So whereas in the past, if you wanted to do something in code, like for example, use the map function in JavaScript and you don't remember how to use it, you wouldn't have had to go online. You would have had to go on Stack Overflow. You would have had to go to the documentation to like figure out. Merrick, what's up, man? Thank you for that raid. Um, Raiders, I don't know if this is the best time to introduce myself. I'm literally having a small aneurysm watching this absolute scam of a video. Let's give a shout out to Merrick Counts. Hopefully your stream was absolutely beautiful. Welcome in. My name is Melky. I work for Twitch. Uh, I don't even fuck it. I, don't, I can't even plug myself right now, dude. Uh, I think the title is Cap. I think the title is Cap, bro. It's not my title. You're out how to use Yeah, rating Melky DevOps. And then you would have had to manually write out the code to use the map function. To manually write out the code to use the map function. It is, I'm not even joking. I think this is less than 50 characters. What is he talking about? Manly, manly writing code DevOps. What is he talking about? Tools that can aid us in writing a lot of code. So whereas in the past, if you wanted to do something in code, like for example, I hate the fact that his advanced example is the map function, the built in map function in Python. We use the map function in JavaScript and you don't remember oh, how to JavaScript. use it. Oh, JavaScript. Sorry, I'm losing my mind. JavaScript. You would have had to go online. You would have had to go on Stack Overflow. You would have had to go to the documentation to like figure out how to use it. And then you would have had to manually write out the code to use the map function. Not manually writing out code. Oh my God. Not manually writing out code to for example map an array in javascript into divs in react or something like that but now oh jesus now with the help of ai you no longer have to necessarily do that so let's say you're building out a project and you don't know how to do something just go and ask ai how to do it there's no reason for you to obsess over like figuring out everything on your own from the documentation or something like that. And this right. might be a controversial take. There's going to be people who disagree with me. Oh, but I just think it's maybe. much more efficient for you to just figure out how to build something as fast as possible using AI. And then after that, go through and understand the code that it has written for you. And then if something doesn't work, or if you just have no idea what it has given to you, you can go and learn that concept, learn that topic mm. enough for you to understand how mm. to fix it and how it mm. works. This will mm. allow you to start mm. generating these portfolio projects that I talked about so much faster than ever before. So coding has changed. It has changed a lot. To me, right now, coding is less about actually understanding these like very detailed and individual coding. So hold on, I'm gonna actually about to destroy you. You think what he's saying is learn by doing? That's not what he's saying. Learn by doing is not giving prompts to AI and not asking itself what is it writing and just copy and pasting it. That is not learn by doing. And it's not a good tip. All right. Learn by doing is actually creating projects and writing them out from scratch, right? You create a project, you write it out. That's learn by doing by building projects. What you just said and what you're defending as a good point, what he just said is having AI do shit for you and you not knowing what it actually wrote and not even thinking about it. You just copy and paste like some sort of schmuck who does not a program. All right. So if you think that is learn by doing and you think it's a good tip, you could continue supporting this dude, all right? 
You can continue watching, you can continue being lost and doing if that's learned by doing. If you wanna be a good programmer, that is not what we do, all right? Everybody knows that. You do not just put some shit into ChatGPT, give it a book, oh, okay, and just splatter it. If you wanna just get a product going, sure. But if you are learning, you're not gonna learn anything by doing that. Topics, like remembering the exact syntax of the map function or something like that. It's a lot more about understanding concepts, understanding the high level of what it means to connect a front end and a back end. When do you wanna use a timeout? How do you use state management? So if you focus on understanding the concepts and you don't obsess on the syntactical details, and instead let AI take care of the syntax for you whenever you don't remember it, you can start generating a lot of really high level projects very, very quickly. And that is the way that you will learn much faster. Essentially outsourcing part of the learning that you would have had to do manually before into AI. As I said before, if you wanna learn any of these topics, I recommend you go down to Zero to Mastery. They have individual courses for each of these if you wanna go and specialize in any of these particular areas. So go check them out and Remember that as much as you might feel like this is overwhelming and like you can't do this, if I was able to do this, if so many other people were able to do this, you can do it too. It's just about doing the boring and uncomfortable work of building out these projects and using these topics as much as possible. And if you just do that and if you just don't quit, you will be able to do it. And if you don't believe in yourself, like I freaking believe in you. Remember that. With that, thank you for watching and I'll see you in the next one. Bye-bye. He had two sponsor plugs. He had one at the beginning, one at the end. Um, yeah, that that was that was on one hundred years ago. My from I, zero. I really did not like that video. He said a lot of things that, yeah. Uh, he talked for yeah. He didn't really say much. I don't really understand what I just watched. Um, that was tough. That was tough. I have to admit that was incredibly tough. I found out that DevOps is everything that's not front end. That DevOps is just committing your front end to your back end. That's DevOps. Uh, I've never heard so many L takes in one video. Yeah, neither have I. Um, 100 years ago, my great- Let's just watch this. Grandfather worked on a farm. Then he got replaced by robots. My grandfather went on to work in a car factory in Detroit. He got replaced by robots. My father went on to become a McDonald's chef, but he too was replaced by robots. I didn't want to suffer the same fate, so I got into programming. They said coding is the new literacy, and everyone needs to learn Python. But then Copilot started writing a little bit of code. GPT-4 started writing a lot of code. But then yesterday, Devin burst onto the scene, an AI that takes over our tooling to write code in an infinite feedback loop. In today's video, we'll find out if this little named Devin is the final death blow for software engineering, or if it's yet another hyped up pile of garbage designed to milk what's left of the VC money in this latest AI hype cycle. It is March 13th, 2024, and you're watching The Code Report. The software engineers right now are absolutely terrified, begging the developers of Devin to stop with- Yo, Jack Forge. Jack Forge, shout out. Please, sirs. My family needs to eat, sirs. Please stop development on this, sirs they're doing. Human software engineers over at Cognition Labs have developed a machine that they're calling the first AI software engineer. If fuck Devin in chat, please. Can we get some F Devins in chat, please? Please? It has access to all the same developer tooling that you do, like a terminal, a browser, a code editor, and so on. And that means it can solve problems like a real software engineer by Googling until you find a blog or Stack Overflow answer that you can copy and paste into your code. A product manager can give Devin some requirements, and <laughs> it will respond by creating a plan of action. Then it goes to the web to get some API documents documentation, then it starts writing some code, then it runs it, it gets an error, it fixes its code, and continues doing this in an infinite loop until it solves the original problem. It's similar to tools like AutoGPT, where an LLM is the base technology, but you give it the ability to perform actions and then react to the feedback that you get from those actions. So Devin is already smashing other tools on the software engineering benchmark, which is a test that determines if AI can solve real world issues on GitHub. Generally speaking, AI sucks really hard at this benchmark. GPT-4 only gets the job done 1.74% of the time, while Devin is currently sitting at 13.8%. 86%. That's a huge improvement, but a tool that can only solve GitHub issues 13% of the time is not quite good enough to replace most software engineers today, although this number will likely improve in the future. Things Available. are going to get really lit, though, when tools like this start doing everything in parallel, like Google's AlphaCoder, which currently beats 85% of competitive programmers, and it does that by using an LLM to generate thousands of possible solutions in parallel, then picks the best one. In the future, you'll be able to post a job just like you would on Upwork, and 10 minutes later, Devin will come back with a thousand different apps. 
apps, and you can choose the best one. In fact, Devin is already doing real jobs on Upwork and getting paid for it. So I guess that makes it official. They took our jobs. Devin can learn new technologies. It can build and deploy apps. It can fix bugs in existing code bases, train its own AI models, train its own AI models, train its own AI models, and do all kinds of other stuff. Pretty impressive, and the company itself is backed by Peter Thiel's Founders Fund, along with the Collison brothers from Stripe, and a bunch of other heavy hitters from Silicon Valley. And Cognition is not the only stealth startup in this game. There's also Magic.dev, which has been funded with over 100 million, and has a shared investor of Elad Gill, who's also made investments into Mistral and Perplexity AI. It's naive to think that Silicon Valley doesn't want to replace programmers. They, they absolutely do. do, and whoever does it first is going to make a ton of money. But there's really no point in being a doomer. For one, there's a very high probability that this technology will be like self-driving cars or 3D printing, which promise to revolutionize the world, but in the grand scheme of things never delivered on those promises. Currently, the only <laughs> thing that Devin can do is bang out crappy little demos, and anyone that's used AI tools over the last year know that they're extremely useful for simple problems, but as soon as you get into more complex problems, they become counterproductive and end up hurting your code more than helping it. However, there's a lot of smart people who think that problem will be... L caused the price of work that can happen in front of a computer to decrease much faster than the price of work that happens in the physical world. Okay, hold on, what? Price of work that can happen from a computer to decrease much faster. Solved. Okay. Like Jensen Wong recently made this bombshell statement. It is our job to create computing technology such that nobody has to program. Everybody in the world is now a programmer. This is the miracle of artificial intelligence. But even if Devin succeeds and coding becomes an archaic skill, there is a solution to that depressing outcome. What and that it? of course is the once daily pill I'm working on with Pfizer. It's a dimethyltryptamine based gene therapy that rewires your brain for optimal coding performance. Common side effects may include headache, diarrhea, geometric hallucinations, ego death, and physical death. So don't let the robots take your death. job. Ask your doctor if getting fire ship pilled is right for you. This has been the Code Report. Thanks for watching and I will see you in the next one. Well, it happened. There's now an AI developer threatening to take our job. 44 minutes? No. That's just too long. That's too long. You back to Twitch? You were, yeah. You're out of the loop? Yeah, I'm back at Netflix. I did my stint. 44 minutes is insane. What do you guys want to do now? Like, I don't even, I don't even know. I think that's just too long. I can't react 44 minutes. It's going to take me way too long than 44 minutes to react to that. I want to do DevOps. Oh, we can just connect the front end to a back end. Just create a, like some sort of, you know, API layer on your back end and your DevOps or go ride a bike. That's also DevOps. What we're doing now is actually DevOps as well. We're actually doing DevOps as we speak. Yeah, does the guy even have a LinkedIn with job history? I don't know. Can someone find that? You guys want to watch this? Or do you want to watch this? Coding skills after... What do I think about AI hype? What do I think about the AI hype? Um, Like, I think a lot of doomers are making it worse. But I think a lot of people who... Ooh, don't understand the power of it. Like I, I, I would say I'm pretty concerned about it. I would say like, you know, did practically code to get, yeah, I did. I did practically code, of course. Um, I would definitely say that the AI hype is pretty concerning. Okay. Um, and I think as of right now, it's not a big deal, but I think as time goes on, it's going to get more and more impressive and more and more dangerous and more and more, you know, I think the developers can be like, damn, wait, it can do what now? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's a trajectory that I'm also concerned about. I think the trajectory of AI is what I'm personally concerned about. Not necessarily the, you know, the hype around it or what it can do right now. Like, I think Devin is, is a lot of the time, um, like, it's, it's just smoke and mirrors right now. Master to zero rather than zero to master. Don't you think so? <laughs> yeah, I do. Uh, so yeah, I don't know. I, I would definitely say there's a, there's room to be concerned. I want to be realistic on that. Okay. Um, I taught myself to code in two months. All right.
Let's do this. Why not? I dropped out of university in debt, trying every online guru's make money business model. But above all, I felt trapped. This is the story of how I went from knowing nothing about coding to building my first full stack application in just two months. When I first dropped out of university, I wanted to find a way to make money my own way. And so I started Googling, entered into the realm of online business gurus and their business models and well, their online courses. And mainly that was focusing around SMA and agency. What's this? LinkedIn. Oh, so that's him. Techie to create with 300k subscribers. Okay, nice. Box.io.ai. Box. Box is an app that allows you to automate and manage your digital life. Automatically open and close apps, files, and uh, let's let's check this out. Boxio.ai. Boxio.ai. The easiest way to hack your productivity. Of course, you want to hack your productivity. All right. What is, what is this? You can download. I'm not downloading shit on this, dude. I'm not downloading anything. So what is this? So, okay. Brings you a simple sidebar to organize your project into boxes. You don't have to see anything, everything at once on your screen. One box represents one project housing all the tools and information that you need. Think of a box as a digital home for a given project. When you open it, a box is everything it holds. Okay. Cool. Cool. Isn't this kind of just like bookmarks? Interesting. Interesting. I, I'm not too sure about this. It looks cool, I guess. I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna download it. And for those of you that don't know what the hell I'm talking about when I say SMA, you're basically selling online digital marketing services to local businesses. Yeah, glamorous. I made some money here and there, but absolutely hated doing it. And I know a lot of people find that too, and that's why the fail rate and stuff like that is so incredibly high. But this continued for many months, many months of trying these different business models of going, you know, all in as hard as you can and then realizing, well, this is just crap. This is outdated. This is oh, yeah, dude, look at this. Um, so Melky, only dev experience on the CV is five months at Deloitte and lead software engineer, co-founder and CTO 10 months later. He's a grifter. Yep. Yep. <laughs> this is not even what I'm actually good at doing. And that's when I had a brand new idea. If there's all these people doing really well with online courses and stuff like that, I thought, well, why don't I build one? And that's when I had the idea to create an online education platform for university dropout. Since I felt it was a group of people I could help and I could use some of that knowledge that I built up over time to execute it and to help other people. And so really excited about this idea and the features that I could create, I started looking up ways to actually build it. Now, at this point, I still didn't want to touch coding with a barge pile. So I used Bubble to build it, which if you don't know, is this no-code platform. You still have to understand a bit of programming in order to be able to do it. But mostly you're just dragging elements and dropping them around and then wiring them together, basically. It's kind of like a Lego way of building an application. So although it was building with a no-code platform, it still taught me a lot about actual programming, especially about databases, relationships, objects, stuff like that. So that's what I would do eight, nine hours a day, watch videos, replicate, try and build these features. But what it did was it also rekindled my longstanding passion for design and user experience. And I mean, really, I was designing UI when I was like 14 in Photoshop for some weird reason. And it's funny how these things all end up connecting together. But let's be honest, it wasn't the right idea at the right time. I mean, some kind of make money course from someone who hasn't made a tremendous amount of money, doesn't really sell well. And I didn't want to become another online uh, guru. So I went back to trying online business models. I thought this time, if I go really big on this SMA niche, I'm going to be in this perfect place to make some money. And well, I had no passion, I had no interest. I, and I'm sure loads of people that try it, don't give a toss whether or not these local businesses do well or not. You have no interest in it. So at this point, I was doing a lot of cold calling, talking, client call, stuff like that. Hated it. But I felt like I just had to keep pushing. I had to do something. But hold on, I didn't hate building okay. an app. I, mean, I can't watch this video. It's been, I'm trying at 1.5 speed and we're like, he hasn't said anything. It's like an early video. I think he'll do good on YouTube, but it's just, he hasn't said anything. And then like, I'm kind of, I kind of got bored. I lost. I lost track, you know, I lost folk. He lost me. He lost me in that video for sure. I'm going to, I'm going to make a video on this, the harsh, how to master web development. I got to make a video on that. You know, have to make a video on this for sure. Should we watch this one? The harsh reality of good software or current software engineers have no deep knowledge. Which one current software engineers have no deep knowledge or the, harsh reality of good software.
Make a satire YouTube video. Nah, I'm already depressed. <laughs> we can get we can get you more depressed. No deep knowledge. Okay, let's go. I think there's a pretty serious problem that started happening in programming culture. I mean, it's been it's been in programming for as long as I've been in, and this is beyond games. Even this is everywhere. Yeah. Um, people don't have a clear picture of what knowledge is deep versus what knowledge is shallow, mm. right? So if you, if you go to school and you're a good student and you learn the difference between n log n and n squared, right? <laughs> that's deep knowledge that will apply in many cases and it's something fundamental about computers, right? Um, on the other hand, if you go on Hacker News and read an article about somebody learning a specific JavaScript API and tutorializing it, right? That's very shallow knowledge because it's just, you're, you're learning about arbitrary decisions that somebody made mm. about how to interface with a thing that you're not even trying to understand, right? And that, but that knowledge became very popular since, let's say since 2005, once, once this second boom of programming happened and everybody realized, oh, you can make a lot of money in programming or whatever, yep. all these people showed up and, Yep. They just want the job where they could do JavaScript, and so they just learn yeah. the API, right? And so th there's been a deluge of shallow knowledge. Um, it's a little bit more complicated than that because part of the way that you learn deep knowledge is by looking at shallow things and reading the pattern underneath. Like, if there's so an API loud. to do something, if it's a good API, then by looking at the API choices, you can understand the problem Everyone's and the mechanics. Even if you can't see the code, it's better if you can see the code inside but if you can't you can still f see some things about the mechanics and, you know one example of that is a graphics api it's like okay they want me to like put the vertex data into a buffer and like lock the buffer and then not touch it why is that oh it's going to the gpu and all this stuff right you can figure this out on the other hand if it's a bad api which most apis are it'll be full of stuff that's stupid and um or even cargo culting where they're copying a good API. So my favorite example of this was when Microsoft did Direct 2D, which was taking Direct 3D, which was successful, and then trying to add font rendering and all that to that. They made um, an ARGB color, right? So red, green, blue, and alpha, a lockable resource. So to create one of these, you had to like lock it and fill the color data and unlock it. And I'm like, you have no idea what you're doing. And I actually told Microsoft this, and they didn't, they did not like my opinion on that. Um, but they were just copying, oh. All right, so I will say, I actually agree with Jonathan Blow. Um, and here's, here's why, before you guys come at me, um, I actually respect Jonathan Blow a lot, but I don't like him. I really don't like the guy, uh, but I do respect him. I think he is very knowledgeable, very smart. And he's one of those like older school, like grumpy ass developers that actually has a very, you know, depth of knowledge, but he's just a dick about it. Um, and I really think if he was nicer and more sympathetic and empathetic, that he could be an absolute force and leader in the space, right? If he had more empathy for a new generation of developers, I think he, uh, you know, I think he would be incredibly, incredibly used. Uh, I mean, loved. But the thing is, he has this approach where, like, he knows there's this shortcoming in new developers where, yeah, there is no understanding of deep knowledge, right? There is no understanding of deep knowledge to the level that he's familiar with, right? A lot of developers, a lot of engineers, do rely on this layer of API and that's their knowledge and the want to kind of uncover uh, how only that API works. It's kind of that same in a really weird way um, knowing like, you know, how do you allocate memory in a lower level programming language versus not even worrying about it and just writing your code? Or how do you actually look at why is your code, you know, what happened to compile code or what's happening behind the scenes of like a package you're bringing in versus just learning that package, which is made by someone as an abstraction layer to that lower level implementation. Um, so holistically, I agree. And like, I actually think I'm in the boat where I want to have a better understanding, a better, deeper understanding. Um, 
of software, right? I think I started as a lot of people where I just wanted to do something quick and fast. And so I learned like the shallow level and now I'm building on and learning more deeper, deeper concepts, knowledge, and just implementations of software. Right. Um, and, and, you know, I understand my shortcoming, but you know, being told that like, Hey, you're an idiot. You don't know anything about coding. Go, you know, go read a textbook. Doesn't sit well with like me. I would be like, bro, you're an asshole, you know? And I truly think if Jay blow, just came at it in a different perspective and he wasn't so like narrow minded. I think he would be like an all-star. Um, but yeah, I mean, even besides how you, your opinion of him, whether he's grumpy, whether he's nice, whether he's mean, whether whatever, he's a very talented engineer. Kind of like George Hotz, if you think about it, right? Um, pretty polarizing figure, but good software engineer. Knows how to, knows how to write software. And I think that is a very beautiful thing to have uh, in this world. And I'm a huge fan of it. Elitism demol demolishes accessibility. Yeah, for sure. And like I said, you know, maybe we do, maybe the world, maybe the world needs more Jonathan Blows. You know, maybe the world needs more Jonathan Blows. I don't know. Uh, but I can tell what I do know. And we're going to go raid Lana Lux. So thank you guys so much for watching my video. I uh, appreciate you all very much. Um, if you guys can, please consider joining the Discord. We're almost at like 4,000 members. YouTube, make sure you guys are joining the Discord as well. I will be streaming tomorrow, so don't forget it. Tomorrow morning, I will be streaming. Same time, same place, same everything. And if you guys can, please consider subscribing to my YouTube. I think not even like 70% of my total viewers are subscribed to my YouTube. So please, let's get that going. I want to get to 25,000 subscribers. That's going to be the goal. I have a new YouTube video coming out tomorrow. Thank you guys so much for everything you do, all the stuff that you support me with, and I'll continue making good content, making everything fun and hilarious, okay? So, you guys are phenomenal. I will see you all soon. And yeah, stay safe, stay beautiful. Tomorrow we've got a new, ray, uh, new stream, new videos. And yeah, my front end master's course is gonna be on the 20th, so next Wednesday. All right, love you all. Stay safe, stay beautiful. Peace.